Uh, welcome to this talk uh, by Yuri Zhukov, um, The Political Legacy of Violence from Battlefield to Ballot Box. I'm Mitchell Orenstein, the uh, Chair of uh, Slavic Languages and Literature. And we're really pleased to welcome Yuri to campus today um, in the context of uh, a search that we're conducting. And um, his, uh, his work, his, his really, um, with a PhD from Harvard in 2014, he's really put together a lot of excellent journal articles in the period uh, since then, and probably some in grad school as well. Um, work, his work primarily focuses on civil conflict, um, civil war, uh, with an emphasis on uh, Russian East Europe. Um, his uh, family background is, uh, is uh, from the region, even from Luhansk. Um, so, uh, so he, you know, not, not, that, not that it was a, a civil war zone at the time <laughs> that he was studying or as a child, but, uh, but it has become one since, and that was also a focus of, uh, of some of his research efforts. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't want to give uh, too elaborate a welcome except to say that we're extremely pleased to have you here today. It's really great to get to learn more about your research and, and also to note that a number of people uh, uh, may, may have to leave a little bit uh, early if that happens, you know, there's no comment on yourself or on the quality of the talk, I'm sure. And, um, and Rudy Sill from Political Science is going to um, moderate the, uh, the question and answer period at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the lecture. So. Thank you so much for being here, and we look forward to your talk. Thank you, Mitchell. Uh, thank you all for coming. So I recently started a, a book project. It originated as a series of articles about political violence, both in the former Soviet Union and beyond. And as I kept working on this topic, I found what seemed like a strange disconnect between the actions that governments take during a crisis to stay in power and what happens after the war ends. And the kinds of decisions that a government makes during the war can make it very difficult to maintain political support after the war ends. I thought that was interesting, and I decided to write a book about it. In a nutshell, why do governments do terrible things, and how do their citizens respond to these terrible things? What is the political legacy of violence? So what do I mean by this question? Webster's Dictionary defines politics as the pursuit or maintenance of power, the power to govern, the power to make laws, the power to throw you in jail if you break those laws. And by violence, I mean the infliction of physical harm to shape a target's behavior. In other words, coercion. Using violence to make someone do something that they would not otherwise want to do. And I'm going to focus on one particular form of violence, and that is repression or violence by an incumbent government against its political opponents. This is violence that a government uses to stay in power at a time when there is an active challenge of some kind to its authority, to its monopoly and use of force. And what the political legacy of violence means in this sense is simply the effect of this oppression on the pursuit of political power by a regime's opponents. In the 20th century, 175 million people died of one form of government repression or another. <clears throat> One third of those deaths occurred in a single country, the Soviet Union. And what I'm asking here is simply what effect did all of that repression have on political opposition? So in the short term, what is the effect of repression on rebellion? Does government violence today increase or decrease violence by the opposition tomorrow or next week or next month? And in the long term, what happens after the war ends? Does violence that happened a long time ago still shape political preferences, political participation? Does violence that happened many years ago shape how people vote and whether they vote? So in the book, I focus on both of these. But right now, I want to spend most of my time on the first question. Because understanding these short-term battlefield incentives, in my view, is absolutely essential if we are to fully grasp the wider implications of these actions. My bottom line, in the short term, repression works, just not in moderation. Before you storm out of the room and protest, let me explain to you what I mean by this. It works in the very narrow sense that it reduces violence by the opposition, but it can only have this effect if governments use a lot of it. I'm going to argue that there is a threshold effect there is a point at which the scale of repression becomes so overwhelming that the opposition is simply unable to recruit new members, 
to replace the ones that they just lost. And the logic here is not one of attrition. The logic is one of deterrence. People are simply too scared to join the opposition. But I'm also going to argue that this kind of mass repression is very difficult to achieve. Most governments, thankfully, are unable or unwilling to go that far. And in fact, this is why some regimes decide to build a police state. Mass surveillance, closed borders, states of emergency. These are all things that reduce individual freedoms, but they also make repression less costly. Because the government has better information and knows which doors to knock on, repression becomes more targeted, more selective. And the sad irony of this is through these repressive institutions, the level of violence needed to reach that threshold goes down. So in the short term, repression works, just not in moderation. But in the long term, repression does not work, unless you're repressed forever. It doesn't work in the sense that it reduces local political support for the perpetrator. And this effect, I will argue, is potentially intergenerational. Violence that happened many decades ago can still reverberate and shape political behavior decades into the future, long after all the main perpetrators and victims had died. And if you want repression to work in the long term, you basically have to keep these policies in place long term. Because repression is probably not going to win you any votes. So what I found was it does suppress the vote. It reduces local politi political participation. It reduces voter turnout. And this effect as well can last for generations to come. To state the obvious, my goal is not to provide advice to dictators on how they should oppress their own people. My goal is to understand why they oppress the people. And to this end, I think this research advances knowledge in several important ways. Because this kind of battlefield to ballot box approach is a relatively new line of inquiry in, in social science. And when big questions like this go unanswered or at least underexplored, it's usually for one of two reasons. Either nobody cares, or it's too hard to do. And in this particular case, it's very hard to argue that nobody cares, because understanding the political legacy of violence can help us answer questions that are fundamental to political science. These range from questions about the dynamics of civil conflict. Why are some conflicts deadlier than others? Why do governments target civilians? One of the implications of my work is that once a regime begins to repress, it becomes very hard to dial that repression back while still maintaining political power. But this research also helps us address broader questions of institutional design and of political behavior long after the conflict ends. Why do autocratic institutions emerge? Why do people vote? Why do they sit out elections? And here, my research potentially explains why civil conflicts are often so bad for democracy. Because these dynamics create very strong incentives for governments to create autocratic institutions to try to reduce the cost of repression and ultimately allow the government to maintain power at a lower level of force. And because these theoretical implications are so far reaching, the literature on this topic has been scattered across multiple disciplines, multiple subfields of political science. And one of the things that I'm trying to do here is build a bridge between literature on civil conflict, most of which has traditionally resided within international relations, and other literatures, such as literature on voting, literature on institutional design. Um, and by doing this, by building this connection, we can answer many so what questions that have pestered conflict scholars throughout the years. Why are you studying these long ago episodes of violence? What are the policy implications of this 20 or 50 or 70 year old conflict? Does any of this still matter today? If these people are so important, why are they all dead? Um, and I'm going to argue that long ago episodes of violence still matter today because they still affect political behavior today. And that's why this topic should be of primary interest to political science and social science more broadly. I'm going to test these propositions using new data from the Soviet secret police. And in particular, I'm going to focus on the NKVD's campaign against the Ukrainian insurgent army in Western Ukraine. And I'm going to focus on the Soviet Union because it has the unfortunate distinction of being the world champion of repression. Do you include victims of the Great Terror, mass deportations, collectivization, decolonization, what am I forgetting? Famine, 
62 million people died of one form of Soviet repression or another. This was quite simply the deadliest political regime that ever existed. And these archival data can potentially help us explain why the Soviets used these tactics and what the consequences of these methods were. The Soviet experience was unique. Well, actually, it was extreme. But it was by no means an outlier. And I'm going to supplement this analysis of the, of the Soviet secret police archives with a meta-analysis of dozens of conflicts worldwide to show you that the Soviet experience is part of a much broader story about political violence. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to begin by giving you a general overview of the conceptual framework behind my argument. I uh, will then explain to you what my main theoretical claims are and some of the data that I'll be using to test these claims. I'm going to present you some preliminary results, and I'll talk a little bit about the generalizability of these findings around the globe. But then I'm going to zoom out a little bit and talk about the longer-term implications of all of this and whether some of these effects can potentially resonate across generations. So what do we know about the short-term political legacy of violence? What is the effect of repression on rebellion? So this has been the topic of a growing and vast literature on uh, the microdynamics of civil war. This is a literature to which I myself have been trying to contribute in my past work. Empirically, this research has relied on micro subnational case studies, village-level data, and this micro-level trend has been on balance a very good thing. It's enabled us to answer questions that would have been unthinkable and unfeasible even uh, two decades ago. But it has come with some important downsides because this micro-level focus has also meant that there have been very few attempts to generalize beyond the idiosyncrasies of a single case. We still don't really have an answer for the question of what does country A tell us about country B. There are also no common units of analysis. There are no common measures and conceptual definitions. It's very hard to compare the results of one study to the results of another. And unsurprisingly, this has led to a string of conflicting empirical results and an unresolved debate about the effectiveness of government violence. On one side of this debate is what I call the inflammatory view. <coughs> Repression does not work. An increase in government violence leads to an increase in rebel violence. This has been the dominant perspective, both inside and outside of academia. This has been the foundation of the U.S. Army's counterinsurgency doctrine. Repression is ineffective at best, counterproductive at worst. People respond to repression by mobilizing against it. After all, is this not what we saw in Kiev during the Euromaidan, in Egypt during Tahrir Square, or Syria? How many times have you heard the argument that if only Assad wasn't so brutally repressive, there would be no civil war? We hear this almost every day. On the other side of the spectrum, is the suppressive view. Repression works. An increase in government violence leads to a decrease in rebel violence. This is sometimes known as the Russian approach to counterinsurgency. The idea is that people rebel because the government is insufficiently firm and has let things spiral out of control. It is better to be feared than loved. It is possible to terrorize a population into supporting you. The reason that the Euromaidan became a full-blown revolution was because Yanukovych didn't crack down hard enough or early enough. If you turn on Russian television, you hear this narrative again and again. My own view is an attempt to reconcile these two perspectives and argue that, in a sense, they are both right, but also both wrong. Repression works, just not in moderation. And this argument comes out of a series of theoretical models that I developed or several papers, both formally and informally. And the basic argument is this. Repression can have this kind of suppressive effect, but only if the intensity of this repression exceeds the opposition's ability to replace losses. If the government succeeds in deterring civilians from joining the opposition. So you can kind of think of political violence as being like an auction, where the government and the rebels are both trying to convince civilians that the costliest, most dangerous thing they can do is to support their opponent. And they do this in part through violence, by killing their opponents, by arresting their opponents, and sending a signal that the same exact thing will happen to anyone else who dares to challenge me. 
This is a game in which the government has escalation dominance. Among other things, it has more resources than the rebels do in most cases. And in theory, if things just continue escalating in this way, eventually things will hit a point in which the rebels are not able to keep up, and are not able to replace their losses, and civilians deem it to be too dangerous to support the rebels. This, of course, begs a question. How much repression is enough? And here I argue that the threshold is kind of a moving target. A lot depends on the local context. If, for instance, the government has poor information on who the rebels are, where the rebels are, it's going to be pretty difficult for the government to selectively arrest and assassinate its opponents. But what it will do instead is it will cast a wider net using increasingly indiscriminate tactics until eventually it's dropping barrel bombs and chemical weapons on residential neighborhoods. The problem with this approach is that it doesn't really give very compelling incentives for people to comply with the repressor. Because for coercion to be effective, it has to be anticipated. It has to be avoidable by accommodation. There has to be a clear red line. The following actions will result in punishment. But if the government is systematically killing all the wrong people, what message does that send? That sends the message that the government does not know who the enemies are. That, may, that means that you may be punished no matter what you do, whether you behave badly or whether you behave, whether you behave well. So then what incentive do I have to comply with you? What the government does in these cases is that it substitutes its lack of information with more violence. And this, in turn, makes repression more costly. The threshold is also higher where the opposition has external support. External support reduces the opposition's reliance on the local population. In this sense, you can repress the local population all you want. You can terrorize them into not supporting the opponent. But if the opposition has an external lifeline, if it has foreign fighters flowing in from outside, if it has foreign funding coming in from outside, it can keep fighting even where it is very costly for the local population to support them. And this, of course, is a nightmare scenario for the government. This may mean that, in many cases, the threshold is exceedingly high and the government has a very little chance of ever reaching it. And so many governments, for this reason, never reach the threshold. And so what we often observe in practice is essentially the government escalating maybe to about here, but not quite to here. And that's why we think of repression as often being universally counterproductive. But there are also things that a government can do about this. It can try to address things like this by instituting mass surveillance, by closing borders, by confiscating everybody's weapons, by creating all these other chronic institutions that reduce the cost of repression and ironically reduce the amount of violence needed to have this kind of threshold effect. I have a formal model of how I think all of this works. I will not torture you with the mathematics. I brought backup slides if anyone wants to take a look under the hood to see how I derived these propositions. But what I want to do right now is I want to turn to the historical record and see if any of this actually lines up with reality. And I'm going to start by discussing the conflict that happened in Western Ukraine in the 1940s and 50s. This is a conflict between the Soviet Union, shown here on the left, and the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists here on the right. This was a separatist group within Ukraine that sought to create an independent and ethnically pure Ukrainian state. This is an important and analytically interesting case. Out of the 30-odd uprisings that the Soviet Union faced during its 70-year history, this is by far the costliest and most protracted one. It, cost, it lasted longer than the war in Afghanistan. It cost more than twice as many Soviet lives. Over 130,000 people died. A quarter of a million people were resettled to Siberia. And while the conflict was happening, it was very hard to find information about it. It was shielded from outside view by a totalitarian regime. But if there was one silver lining to all this, is that the NKVD, the Soviet secret police, it turns out, were actually sticklers about paperwork. <coughs> and they left behind a treasure trove of archival records that have never before been systematically analyzed, at least not in political science. And historians have looked at this week. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a new data set based on declassified incident reports from local and regional and central organs of the NKVD, the Interior Ministry, the Communist Party, as well as 
uh, rebel documents that were seized by the Soviets. Um, this is what one of these documents looked like. Uh, the interesting thing about these records is that this is the exact information that the Soviets were using to make decisions. This is their information set. We're seeing what they were seeing at the time. And so let me show you a couple of these documents and the kind of information that they contain. So here's an example of a rebel action with uh, the original text in Russian in gray and an English translation underneath. So on 30th of October, an armed gang killed a city committee instructor and a local resident, while the latter two were, were in the rural council building in Lutsky district. No reports of rebel casualties. And you can already see that this one sentence contains a lot of information. It tells us who did what to whom, when and where. Armed gang killed the government employee, a civilian, in Lutsk on October 30th. This is exactly the kind of hard facts that we need if we're trying to build an event data set. So you can, you can think of these boxes being like one row in a giant spreadsheet that we're filling out. Here's an example of a government action. December 7th, during an AKVD search and destroy mission a civil, in the Stozhinsky district, a civilian was detained and shot. It later emerged that she was a mother of 11 children, three of whom are serving in the Red Army. No rebels killed, no government killed. Just a civilian who was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Just to clarify, this was the Soviets writing about their own operations. There was no attempt to cover this up. They just did not expect anyone that saw the command chain to read this. These documents were top secret for a good reason, because this does not look good for the government. And there were tens of thousands of these. If these are stored electronically, I can write a computer program that extracts the dates and the locations, puts it all into a nice spreadsheet for us to use, but this is not the Library of Congress. These are underfunded Russian and Ukrainian archives where you have to, most of these records are stored on what looks like wax paper or microfilm. You need to look at these documents through these 1970s era microfilm machines with cracked lenses and missing bulbs. So I had to go about this the old fashioned way, reading them and manually entering them into a spreadsheet. I, um, there were tens of thousands of these. Uh, I probably will require therapy at some point from reading all of this over and over again. But what this allowed me to do was to essentially forensically reconstruct the entire conflict from beginning to end. This is what Ukraine looked like in the 1940s and 50s after Stalin annexed West Ukraine from Poland in 1939, before Khrushchev transferred Crimea to Ukrainian uh, uh, sovereignty in uh, 1954. Darker colors on the map indicate more violence. This time plot here shows the dynamics of violence, the number of violent events in a given week from beginning to end. Here's another view of the same data, now just broken down between rebel actions on the left, government actions on the right. And here's a time plot with rebel and government actions separated out. Government is in blue, number of uh, government and rebel operations per month. So the conflict started in 1943. At this time, this, this part of this territory was under complete German occupation. And the only Soviet presence in this territory at the time were the partisans, who started carrying out raids <coughs> in Western Ukraine. The organization of Ukrainian nationalists, you see here on, on the left, always saw the Soviets as a more dangerous political enemy between the Germans and the Soviets. And so they, they responded to these partisan raids by starting a militia of their own called the Ukrainian Insurgent Army, or UPA. And the UPA began a campaign of terror against suspected Soviet collaborators and informants. This campaign reached its peak in 1944-1945 after the Soviets recaptured this territory from the Germans. From the Soviet standpoint, this is not an easy fight. This whole territory had been under foreign occupation for several years, and in that time period, the Germans had managed to kill every single local communist, managed to dismantle the local Soviet law enforcement. Even before the war, the Soviets only controlled this territory for about a year and a half before the Germans came in. This, after all, used to be Poland. So they had no informant network to speak of. They were going in blind. 
And as you would expect, they compensated for this lack of information with more violence. You can already see this over here. Look at how many government operations there were relative to rebel operations. There's about 1,000 government operations per month compared to well, about, you know, at most about 200 uh, rebel operations during the same time. To give you a sense of how indiscriminate the Soviet violence was, in 1944, the Soviets killed or captured 100,000 people. During the same time period, they confiscated 26,000 weapons, mostly small arms. In other words, there was one weapon for every four people the Soviets killed or captured. And this is according to their own data. And this conflict dragged on for years, and by the, around 1950, it had become legitimately low, low intensity. Uh, most of the OUN had gone underground. Most of its leaders were either dead or in exile. The OUN could no longer count on the kind of massive popular support that they had at the end of World War II. And the, the kind of support that they still needed to fight the Soviets. And they were, there were occasional flare-ups, but for all intents and purposes, they were done. And a key question is whether the Soviet military victory in this case was because of or in spite of these brutal tactics that they used. And to find out the answer to that question, I took these data and I put them into a predictive model to see how rebel violence varied as a function of what the Soviets were doing the previous time period. So what you're seeing here is the results of simulations based on uh, one particular statistical model, which is quasi Poisson generalized added model with fixed effects. I'm happy to talk about the actual spe spe specification in Q&A, but the basic idea is this. The number of rebel attacks in a given district in a given week is a function of Soviet violence in the same time in the, in, the, in the same location during the previous time period, as well as previous rebel actions, while controlling for terrain, logistics, demographics, population density, ethnicity, as well as unobserved heterogeneity over space and over time. The way you can interpret a graph like this is the horizontal axis here is the hypothetical intensity of oppression, ranging from zero. NKVD operations per district week to 500 per district week. The vertical axis is the predicted level of rebellion, rebel, at, rebel attacks the following time period. The blue line here is the average, and the, the blue shade is the margin of error, or 95% confidence interval. If you want to have a sense of how frequently the Soviets actually used this or that level of violence, you can take a look at uh, these little little vertical dashes over here. Each of these represents a single observation, a single district, in a single week in which the Soviets used 100 operations, 400 operations. And what this graph shows you is that Soviet repression worked, just not in moderation. There was not very much rebel violence after very low or very high levels of repression, but there was quite a bit more rebel violence after intermediate levels of repression. There's more violence in the middle. And just to be clear, the purpose of this model is prediction, not causal estimation. There are other methods we could use uh, to actually identify the causal effect of government violence on, re on rebellion, and I'm happy to talk about that as well. But all I'm presenting to you here is simply the average. What is the average level of rebel violence we should expect after the Soviets conducted this, this many or that many operations in a given place in a given time? And the shape of the curve is pretty much what we would expect if the threshold model were correct. But we should also note that the Soviets weren't really getting a lot of bang for their buck. It took, a, according to this model, it took about 300 additional operations per district week to reduce the level of rebel violence from two to zero. This is extremely asymmetric. It's kind of like using a grenade launcher to kill a fly. And the reason it was so asymmetric was because of the Soviet's very poor intelligence about who and where the rebels were. No one put this better than Stalin himself. Even before this conflict started, he made clear what his position was on this. Because it is not easy to recognize the enemy, the goal is achieved even if only 5% of those killed are truly enemies. You can let that sink in. This is what Stalin, you know, Time Magazine, Man of the Year in 39. Uh, this is what he actually believed. Uh, and he put this theory into practice. And of course, this begs several questions. Because one of the problems with this 5% rule 
It's that 95% of the people you're killing are not really your enemies. And even if you can manage to suppress a rebellion using these, these techniques in the short term, you kind of have to wonder whether there are some longer term challenges that might result from this. It also begs another question of how, just how much of an outlier the Soviet case was. Because after all, most countries are not Ukraine. Most leaders, thankfully, are not Stalin. And most rebels today are not far-right nationalists. This, the Ukrainian case, I think, is a, an important one, and a deep study of this, these local dynamics is, in and of itself, a worthwhile enterprise. But it's also important that we understand how this case fits into the broader picture. And it turns out that these results generalize quite well. So I looked at the first chapter and more. Here I took incident reports from another source, the Russian Human Rights Organization, Memorial. Uh, these are also text incident reports uh, that are drawn from open sources, from media reports, as well as Memorial's local network of human rights monitors in the Caucasus. Um, thankfully, these records were electronically stored, so I didn't have to manually enter them. I could use uh, natural language processing and other techniques that turn them into data. But beyond that, I kept everything else the same, same units of analysis, same model. I also looked at other levels, uh, grid cells, different temporal levels of aggregation to make sure that aggregation bias and measurement are not what's driving these results. What did I find? A very similar looking curve with really a, a wider margin of error. Keep in mind, this is a conflict that the, that the Russians lost. But at the local level, in the short term, which is all that you're seeing here, Repression had a similar kind of non monotonic relationship with the rebel violence. Repression worked just not in moderation. I also looked at Syria, drawing incident reports from the IISS on conflict database, using a slightly different approach to turn them into data. Here I use supervised machine learning. Other than that, everything else was largely the same. A very similar looking relationship there. I looked at the second Chechen war. And the broader conflict in the North Caucasus that unfolded during Putin's first two terms in office. Same source as before, same approach, very similar result. I also looked at Libya. Here I drew incident reports from Al Jazeera from International Wire Services, conducted the same kind of analysis. And here I found that the curve is also concave, but there's a key difference here. According to this model, the Libyans, Gaddafi started, and never quite made it past the threshold. So this darker shade, shaded part of the curve right here is the part of the simulation from which we actually have data. Beyond this, we're extrapolating. And what this model tells us is that eventually, when, when Gaddafi escalated enough, violence became less inflammatory, but it never fully became suppressive. And this is an important point that I want to come back to. There was a reason the Libyans never really cross that threshold. To take this one step further, I conducted a full-blown meta-analysis of hundreds of conflicts at the micro level worldwide. At Michigan, some colleagues and I are developing a new initiative called Cross-Sub, <coughs> cross-national data on subnational violence, which brings together micro-level data, the kind that I just showed you, for hundreds of armed conflicts from multiple data sources, which we put into uh, consistent units of analysis, consistent measures, so as to make results maximally comparable across countries, across conflicts, across data sets, so we can finally conduct a cross-national analysis of sub-national conflict. We can finally answer the question of what does conflict A tell us about conflict B. Here are some of the data sources in our collection from our partners, some of which you may be familiar with, which I decided to use for this part of the analysis. Of course, it is, uh, ACLID, or the on-conflict location event data set, which contains micro-level data of 59 countries, mostly in Africa and South Asia. I also looked at UCDP's GED data set, which contains micro-level data on 81 countries. I looked at the Political Instability Task Force's Mass Atrocities data set, which contains 123 countries, but slightly fewer events. I also looked at this the substate conflict analysis, um, the social conflict analysis data set, which contains data on 60 countries in Central America and Africa. And what I did 
was I replicated the analysis I showed you earlier for every conflict in each of these massive data collections. And what I'm going to show you here is I'm going to go country by country and show you that this is part of a general pattern. So what you're seeing here, so each column here represents a data source. In this case, ACLID and SCAD did not have data on Afghanistan, so they're blank in this case. The top row shows something the map, the geographic distribution of events. And then there are simulations from two sets of hierarchical models. The first of these is a varying intercept model where I allow the baseline level of violence to vary from country to country. And the second is a varying slope model in which I allow the actual shape of the curve to vary from place to place. So I'm going to loop through all of these. This is going to move pretty quickly, but what I want you to pay attention to in particular is the shape of the curve and how it varies from case to case. So a couple of things I want to know. First of all, in most, but not all cases, we see a similar type of upside down U-shaped curve, which seems to suggest some kind of threshold effect. But this is certainly not the case in all of them. There are quite a few cases in which the relationship is strictly positive. And the second thing is that there are quite a few cases where the government never reaches the threshold. In many cases, it actually does not. As you can tell by the dark versus light shade on this curve, and these two problems are, of course, related. If you never reach the threshold, of course, violence is always going to look counterproductive. It's always going to, going to look inflammatory. And you can also see that the actual distribution of events varies greatly from source to source, which further underscores the need for this kind of meta-analysis. Two different data sources may potentially tell you a different story. And if we were to sum up these results and tally up how many countries had which type of curve, you can see that in the vast majority of cases, between 57% and 86%, the relationship was this kind of upside down U-shaped curve. The top row here is the average relationship over all conflicts in each data source. The bottom, uh, th this row right here shows the individual slopes for each country. And you kind of have to zoom in to see what's happening because the scale of violence varies greatly from country to country. And so, there are a couple puzzles here. First of all, why does the curve sometimes look like this, other times look like this? Because it is true that in most of the remaining cases, the relationship is strictly inflammatory. And second, why does the threshold itself, the level of violence needed to reach a threshold, vary so much from case to case? And these two puzzles are, of course, related. The, the second puzzle is a potential answer to the first. Where the threshold is higher, fewer countries are going to reach it. And in fact, what I find is that governments often do not reach the threshold. If you simply look at the distribution of events, most of them fall on the left tail. While where government violence is strictly counterproductive, where it increases follow subsequent rebel violence. And you can see this from case to case, from country to country. So most of what we observe in the real world falls on this side of the curve, which is why we often think of government violence and repression as being counterproductive. We rarely witness cases in which the government really goes all out. Here is Eastern Ukraine. The conflict that's happening right now, these are data that I collected for a different project. According to my model, it would have taken the Ukrainian army at least 100 operations per district per week to exceed the threshold. The most they ever achieved was 25. They never even came close. What happened instead was every act of violence by the Ukrainian side was met with even greater escalation by the other side. And the Ukrainian case actually illustrates quite nicely why governments often do not reach the threshold. Because the so-called People's Republics of Donetsk and Luhansk benefit from extensive external support from Russia. And where the opponent has external support, the threshold tends to be high. And you can see the same thing in Libya, where NATO was the rebels' air force. The reason the threshold is higher where the, the opposition has external support is because external support makes the opposition less reliant on the local population. So you can terrorize the local population into not supporting your opponent, but if this group has NATO jets bombing government positions, then it doesn't really matter how hard you, co you coerce the local population. It will be very hard to reach that effect. And so rebels who are able to keep fighting 
even where it is very costly for the local population to support them. The threshold is also higher where the government has poor information. So what you see here are two curves. One is for selective tactics, like arrests, assassinations. The other is for indiscriminate tactics, like airstrikes, artillery shelling, indirect fire. And where the government has poor information on who the rebels are, where the rebels live, it has to rely on much more indiscriminate force. It has to substitute information, uh, substitute violence for information. And if the government is killing all the wrong people by using these indiscriminate tactics, as you see in Chechnya, as you see in Libya, as you see in many cases around the globe, fewer opponents are killed per unit of effort, more civilians are killed, and if bad behavior does not get punished, if good behavior does not guarantee uh, safety, then it's not really clear what kind of message you're sending, what kind of incentives people have to cooperate with you. And governments, in order to have a course of effect with this kind of blunt instrument, have to use a lot more violence. This, in turn, makes repression more costly. So not a lot of silver linings in the story. And unfortunately, it only gets worse from here. Because one of the lessons of history is that repression only works if you repress massively or not at all. But if a government represses massively, it has also painted itself into a corner. Because mass murder is not a sustainable governing strategy. For every person you kill, that's a potential soldier that's not joining the army, that's a potential lost labor, that's a potential lost revenue, that's that's lost economic output, the government may hang on, but there could be little by way of growth or development if the government is systematically exterminating its own population. So how can the government get around this problem? How can it lower the threshold? Well, it can try to address all these issues that I just told you about. It can improve the information it has about its, about its opponents. One of the first things that the Soviets did after World War II was to conduct a population census in, uh, in Western Ukraine to try to figure out who these people are. They then built up a network of informants so extensive that much, not even what you say in your own kitchen can be considered private. You can cut off your opponent's external support. You can build a border wall, as some Ukrainian politicians have proposed doing on the border with Russia. You can impose a siege on an opposition stronghold to prevent anyone from coming in or out. You can simply confiscate all weapons from the population. The Soviets actually did this in the 1920s, kind of repealing the Second Amendment. I found those data, and I wrote that paper too. And the government is simply trying to control the population by imposing a curfew, by forcibly resettling people away from the conflict zone into areas where they could be more easily monitored and observed. All of these things have a thread in common. If we were to call things by their names, what we're talking about here is a police state. Mass surveillance, state of emergency, population control, these are all things that restrict individual freedoms, but they also reduce the level of violence the government needs to keep power. If the government knows which doors to knock on, instead of indiscriminately, indiscriminately shelling a neighborhood, it can selectively target its opponents. Violence becomes more targeted, less visible. And the sad irony of all of this is that these kinds of autocratic, autocratic institutions in a very perverse way, save lives by making the government kill fewer people. And there's kind of this fundamental trade-off here between freedom and staying alive. Which of these do you want? It's very hard to have both in a post-conflict environment. So autocracy often becomes the foundation for domestic peace. The government goes from substituting violence for formation for substituting autocracy for violence. And I want to conclude with a little sneak peek into what happens later. As we go several decades into the future. Because beneath all these charts and graphs that I just showed you are people like you and me. These people saw what just happened. And they remember, these are things that one tends not to forget. And in the second half of the book, I ask what happens next. After the violence stops, as people return to civilian life, as they have kids, or kids have kids, as new political leaders take over, as the battlefield becomes an increasingly distant memory. And what I find is that the legacy of violence can stay with us for a very 
a very long time. In Western Ukraine, the same region I just told you about, the areas that were more heavily exposed to Soviet repression are less likely to vote for pro-Russian parties. In a forthcoming paper in the Journal of Politics, we took the archival data that I just showed you. We matched them up with the polling station level electoral results for national elections in Ukraine going back to 2004. And uh, we used a variety of identification strategies to try to exploit exogenous variation and repression. It's very hard to send people to camps in Siberia if you do not have, a, have access to railroads. We used other strategies as well to identify the causal effect. And what we found was that the relationship between past repression and contemporary support from Moscow is consistently negative across all these election cycles. What you're seeing here is the standardized effect, basically the effect of standard deviation increase in, uh, in Soviet era deportations, uh, standard deviation shifts in the pro-Moscow vote margin. These are party regions, the communists, the opposition bloc. And so for instance, in 2012, Locations that are more heavily exposed to Soviet violence were about, saw a decline of about a third of the standard deviation in the vote share of these parties. And this is not just West versus East. This is all within the West. If you look at two villages that are located right next to each other, one of which experienced a high level of Soviet repression, the other one experienced a low level, the village that experienced more repression is less likely to vote pro Moscow today. In another paper with the grass student, we did the same exact thing for Russia itself. We found millions of arrest records from Stalin's, uh, from the Stalin era. We matched them up with polling station level electoral results, basically uh, using the same exact empirical strategy. And we found that more, more heavily repressed areas were much less likely to vote for Putin today. Maybe it's something about former KGB colonel in the Kremlin that gives these people pause. Maybe it's they're simply distrustful of the incumbent, whoever's in charge. In Russia, these two things are empirically indistinguishable. But it is also the case that these areas that are more heavily repressed are also more likely to vote for the liberal opposition parties today. So parties like Yabloka, uh, SPS, uh, it's now being Barnas, and these are parties which do terribly in Russian elections. They're not very popular, but in these parties, they actually do much better than they do on average in the country. And this is not simply an urban versus rural thing. Even if you look within the city of Moscow, the neighborhoods of Moscow that saw more oppression under Stalin are more likely to vote for these parties today. Now, this all sounds like repression in the long term doesn't really work. But we also found something else that we thought was interesting. Because these areas that are more heavily oppressed are much less likely to vote in the first place. There is a consistent negative effect on voter turnout. You can think of Stalin era repression as being the most successful long term voter suppression effort in history. So in decades later, these same areas you know, they, they tend to keep their heads down in national elections. From Putin's standpoint, this is probably a good thing because these areas are less likely to vote for him in the first place. So, unmet, these two problems kind of cancel each other out. Governments do terrible things to stay in power. And the key insight of everything I just showed you is that these terrible things can be much more consequential than we tend to think, and even more consequential than perhaps even the perpetrators may have imagined at the time. Repression works, but only if you repress massively or not at all. But if a government oppresses massively, it, all, it is very hard to go back to the way things work, because the scars run so deep that they can fundamentally alter the institutions of a state, making it less free. And short-term military successes can come at the expense of long-term political loyalty. So in the short-term, repression works, just not in moderation. In the long-term, repression does not work unless you repress forever. These are policies you have to keep in place indefinitely. Nobody has ever been able to do this. Eventually, all things come to an end. It's been a pleasure sharing my research with you. I look forward to your questions. Press off to you in terms of keeping the questions balanced across the room and maybe wait for a few people to leave first.